watching and listening um, the talks. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, multilingual language, uh, multilingual language models, their evaluation, and some of the impacts that these models have, um, especially in the context of uh, equity. Um, all opinions are my own, by the way. Um, they don't reflect Microsoft's uh, positions on some of these things. And um, I'm going to apologize for being a bit rusty because I'm currently on holiday in uh, Watamu, Kenya. So uh, my, my work brain is a little bit off. Um, first of all, um, for this work, um, I'd like to thank uh, and, and highlight the superstars who made it possible. Uh, um, this work uh, took a lot of people uh, to put together. Um, I'd like to thank Kabir, Hashita, Rishab, Millicent, Kathika, um, Prachi, Arkai, sorry, Ashkai, um, Nuja, Samir, Kalika, and Slayana. Uh, this work is a collaboration between Microsoft Research India and Microsoft uh, Africa Research Institute. And it's the first work um, uh, which is a part of a series of work that we're doing at the moment on understanding how to evaluate the performance of large language models. Okay, so let's start with large language models. Um, what are large language models? Um, simply a model is a representation, an approximation of some task or problem using mathematical tools. So what we're interested in is so we're saying, this is what we want to do. Give me some function that approximates that. That's what a model is. By large, what we mean is that the number of parameters that are contained in these models, i.e. to approximate whatever it is that we're interested in capturing, are very, very large. Um, typically, we're now talking hundreds of millions to trillions or oh, sorry, hundreds of millions to trillions of parameters, uh, trillions of parameters in order to capture what it is that we are trying to accomplish. And by language, here what we're referring to is the task for which we build the model. So we're interested in a mathematical approximation of language using very, very many parameters. And effectively, that's all a language model is. And in the last year, ChatGPT has shown that there's a huge amount or there's a huge appetite uh, for these types of models. Um, it's been a runaway success, and success here I've put an asterisk on because it depends on how you define it, but in terms of the time to reach 100 million users, it's by far the fastest adopted application that we've seen. It took ChatGPT approximately two days to reach 100 million users, um, which tells you something about the appetite uh, for these models and the capacity that they have. Now, having said that, um, let's talk a little bit about what it is that these models do. Um, generative, they are generative. What that means is that these models leverage the huge amount of text that they use to train in order to generate human-like text. And we emphasize human-like text because it's not a human writing it, it's a model, and it will have all the biases, all the deficiencies of a model. Um, we've seen these models um, take over uh, in terms of the imagination of users. Um, we've seen them excel in a huge range of tasks including natural language comprehension, logical reasoning, and text generation. And via that, they're now transforming the applications that you can use. Uh, so the question is, for us at least, how well do these models perform for the world? And if we think about the world, we have to think about the languages that people speak across the world. So how well do these models perform for non-English languages? Um, before getting into that, let me just go back a bit. And let me talk about a little bit on the success, what drives the success of these models. Um, it comes from three components. It comes from compute, data, and parameters. And over the last 10 years, what we've observed is as we increase compute, and we increase the data size, and we increase the number of parameters, yeah, we get a almost linear correlation in the drop in the test loss, meaning that the performance of these models increases. Yeah. So we really are thinking about the machinery to run these models yeah, has exploded. It's, we've got much, much larger data sets. We've increased the compute that we apply to these models. And because we have large data sets, we need more parameters to be able to represent them and to capture them. So we've made these models much, much bigger. Yeah. And Correspondingly, we've seen 
a huge increase in the performance of these models. Yeah. But along with that, there'll be an increase in the cost of operating these models because each flop of a compute costs money. Yeah, and at the moment it's estimated that the flops per second are going to versus per dollar are estimated to double by approximately every two years, while the model sizes are increasing up to 10 times within a year. So hardware isn't moving fast enough to keep up with the speed that these things are um, growing in. Um, the other aspect of this is now that you have larger models, you need more data. You need more data so that you're not fitting. Yeah, you need more data so that you're capturing a wider perspective of the world, but data is limited. Yeah, it's estimated that uh, available data for each train models might increase by about 10, time, um, 10 times per year. But for a lot of languages, especially the languages that we speak in Africa, um, this isn't really enough. Yeah, Swahili, for example, which is estimated to have about 8 million, 80 million users, represents um, less than a thousandth of a percentage um, in terms of the data that is out there. Um, Hindi, which has uh, almost half a billion users, um, represents about um, a hundred, uh, half a hundred uh, of, percent of, of the data that's used to train these models and that's out there. And German, on the other hand, which has significantly smaller number of um, um, Hindi speakers, has yeah, much, much better data, almost uh, two orders of magnitude more data. Yeah. So we have a problem. We have large models that need a huge amount of data in order to be trained, yeah, but we simply don't have the data. Yeah. So inequity in these models means that the models are not universally useful to everybody that could possibly use them, simply because the language data that is needed for their specific language is not available. Yeah. And in this work, yeah, what we're interested in is understanding how well these models actually work for these languages, yeah, the languages that aren't English. And the reason is that LLMs are typically, or rather primarily trained using English data from the global north. Yeah, but 6 billion people across the world don't speak um, English as their first language. Yeah, so how useful are these things? And in order to understand that, this work is the first work where we um, that does a comprehensive look at a huge range of languages across different language families and across tasks in order to understand what are the capabilities of these models. Yep. And here on the right, the figures that you see are for uh, various models that we found online. Yeah. So if you look at the GPC-3, for example, 93% of the data that is used to train the model is English. For Palm, it's 82%. Bloom is a little bit better. It specifically tries to capture a wider range of languages, but still 30% of the data that it uses is English. So these models are inherently biased towards English. Um, in this work, what we do is um, we introduce a comparative evaluation um, using 70 topologically diverse languages, 16 different tasks across four different language models. Here we use um, three of the GPT family models. That's uh, GPT-3.5, uh, the text da Vinci model, the GPT-3.5 Turbo model, and GPT-4, as well as the Bloom model. When we look at their performance yeah, across the set of tasks, and we compare their performance to specifically trained fine-tuned models, like the Turing V6 model and the mu RL model in order to understand how effective are they. In effect, we're interested in understanding how well they work out of the box compared to something that's been trained for tasks with specific languages that aren't in English. And we also look at how to instruct these models in order to produce text yeah, and the impact that that has. So how well can we actually use affordances that are outside of what the model is being trained on or construct in order to structure how we present data to it in order to improve the performance. We look at uh, a range of tasks, including classification, question answering, sequence, uh, sequence labeling, generation, and responsible AI tasks, and examine how well these people do. Um, finally, I've said already, um, these are the models that we're looking at, the OpenAI models, the, uh, the Bloom model, and a set of uh, 
uh, the state of the art fine tuned uh, models for certain different baselines. And our prompting approach is effectively we provide the model with a set of instructions using the prompt source uh, tool and then look at how it performs. And we try three different strategies. And by no means is this um, comprehensive because, as we'll see later, there is a multitude of different choices that we can make. But we try a strategy which is a uh, multilingual prompting, which I'll talk about in a moment. Another one which is uh, uh, called zero short cross lingual prompting and the translation using an affordance. Okay. So this is an example um, to give people an idea of what a prompt looks like. A prompt is typically structured um, to have an instruction. So here the yellow box is um, the instruction that we give to the to the model. So let me stop a bit. Um, when we're interacting with these models, what we're typically doing is we're presenting them with some data. Yeah. And that data typically includes some task definition, which says you will do X, Y, and Z. Yes, babe. We may present them with one or more examples of doing that task. Yeah, and then we ask a question or we ask it to solve a problem. Yeah, so here you can see that structure. The yellow part here is instruction. It tells the model that it's an assistant and its task is to solve uh, natural language inference problems. Yeah, we give it a few examples here. The examples are given in Hindi. And then we ask the question uh, for which the model has to select true, false, or neither. Yeah, and we give it an example for the right answer. And then we give it a test for example. We say, this is the final question, please provide an answer. I hope that's clear. Um, examples for different types of prompting vary for the kind of task that you're interested in. So for example, for the natural language inference tasks, you might be asked, you're effectively doing text or entails, if you're saying, given this input, yeah, can what's the hypo does the hypothesis support uh, some premise, or can you come up with a hypothesis that um, that that that, that, justi that is justified given the information that we've given you? Yeah, for different tasks, effectively, what you're doing is you're varying that particular input, and more specifically here, what we've done is we've gone back to the literature and we've tried to collect as many different tasks that we could find that have been published for benchmarking language models and then presented them in these prompt structures in order to test them. Um, what we'll see later on is that this may not necessarily be enough to test these types of models. Um, the monolingual prompting. So let's start with that. In the monolingual prompting setting, what we're interested in is saying, um, if we give the model the instruction, the examples, and the task in the language that we're interested in, how well does it do? Yeah. We would imagine that um, being given instruction in, let's say, Swahili or let's say Zulu or let's say Hindi might make the model actually understand what the task is because it's getting that description in there. So this tests that particular setting. In the K shot setting, what we do is we provide um, a instruction. In this case, we're going to provide the instruction in English, and you can refer to the paper which I link um, if you're interested in understanding what happens when we provide the instruction in the target language. Yeah. And then we ask a question in the target language. We call the language provides the instruction in a pivot language and the language that we test a target language. And what we're interested here in understanding is um, if we pivot through a language, uh, do we get a better result? And by pivoting, we're going through another language in order to hopefully get an idea of uh, to improve the model's answer and performance. The last example that we test in the paper is using an affordance. And here, the affordance that we use is translation. Um, there are many other types of affordances that you could use. For example, you can do transliteration, you can do um, 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 paraphrasing and so forth, but we just, we were, we we're trying to keep it simple so that we can control the variables and we just look at the impact of translation. And what we're interested in here is saying, if our model doesn't work so well in whatever target language we're interested in, what happens if we put it through another, um, a, a language for which the model performs better? 
and come back into our language. So an example here would be, we're interested in answering a question in Swahili. Um, we give the instruction in English, then we translate the Swahili question into English, get the answer in English, and then translate it back into Swahili. And you can see from that example that the bottleneck here, and it's going to limit our performance, is going to be that translation function. How well does that affordance allow us to be able to utilize a, a higher resource language for which the model does well? By the way, please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and then uh, I'll pick them up at the end. Having given that framework, um, I'll present some results. And these are some of our early results. We're still doing more result, um, experiments with more languages. And what we're trying to understand here is, given that setup, of, we're going to try to probe the model in a multilingual setting with an affordance by modifying the types of examples that it gets, how well does it perform? So the first thing that we find is that the GPT-35 uh, models typically perform worse than the state-of-the-art models. And by the state-of-the-art models here, I mean the models that are specifically trained for tasks with extra languages. So out of the box, they will not work as well as a model that is trained with uh, Swahili data or trained with Europa data, for example. Yeah, we find that if we jump to the GPT-4 models, yeah, that their performance increased significantly. So um, I think it's hard to say here, but for the XNLI example, on average, for GPT-3, uh, we go from uh, an accuracy of 52% to about an accuracy of 75%, which is still lower than the 88% for the specifically fine-tuned model, but it's still a considerable jump. It's almost 11 uh, percentage points. Um, looking at the, um, the comparison between the GPT-3s and the GPT-4s, as I've said, we find that the GPT-4 has a better performance in across more languages so it's more suited to multilingual use than the gpt3 models yeah but then um, 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 when when we look at the really really low resource languages we also find that translating to a pivot language typically english gives you a higher uh, performance in fact we did the experiments across the combinations of languages and so forth and we found that typically um, regardless of what the task language is, providing instructions and examples to the model in English, regardless of your target language, performs better. And if I give you some examples of this, comparing across those languages, we find that zero short cross lingual transfer performs significantly, uh, similarly to uh, monolingual performance for the GPT-3 models, but shows a drop in performance for the GPT-3 turbo models which are meant to be a little bit better and are meant to be a little bit more compute efficient. Yeah, we find that this is especially worse for languages which are especially low resource, uh, such as the Quechua languages, uh, the Quechua language which is spoken in, in the Andes, I believe, and uh, Haitian Creole. Yeah. We find that grinding the model through a monolingual prompt yeah, helps it understand these languages better. And that results in a better uh, prediction. Yeah, we find that uh, using affordances such as um, translation typically improves the, the performance on the test language uh, and often significantly for some new source, uh, low resource languages. Um, we're not quite sure why. You know, we can imagine that the reason might be um, because uh, there's a lot more data available in English, but then we have to contend with what is the translation quality when you go from the, the, the target language to the pivot language. Yeah. Furthermore, we find that um, for data sets with low resource, that are low resource or not in the Latin uh, script, tend to gain more significantly from translation. So if you're working in Hindi or in Arabic, instead of querying and interacting with a model in English, sorry, in, in, in Arabic or Hindi, you are more likely to get a better result if you translate that and put it to English and then translate it back again. So round trips to English seems to be a strategy that works well 
to these types of low research languages. Now, having said that, the question that appears, which is, do you translate every language? Uh, and how, what, what, what's the impact of this translation? Um, it turns out that translation isn't always a good thing. Yeah. Here, we look at um, what's the impact of translating through a given language. And we find that for some languages, such as Burmese here, yeah, um, which by this language classification is a fairly low resource language, uh, language improves significantly when we translate to English. But then if you look over here in the middle, when you go to languages such as English or Spanish, uh, sorry, uh, French or Spanish or Chinese, which have large data sets on their own, uh, translating through English does not actually help. It might actually hinder your performance. Yeah. So depending on the kind of language or the, the resourcedness of the language that you're dealing with, you may you may not get a, 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 a boost through English. More importantly, yeah, for some languages which are high resource, the performance is already similar to English. It's less, but it's, it's similar. And translating to English gives you a lower performance, which raises the question of what is it that you're getting when you translate into English for things like Burmese, and you're not getting when you translate to when you translate languages like French. And we think that this has got to do with the context and the nuances of the language, and this is work that we're doing. So to give you a little bit more detail, um, when you have a, such a low resource language like Tamil or Malayan uh, or Basque, um, when you go to English, you're covering a large chunk of that language. You're covering a decent enough chunk of that language that you get the value of English. When you go to French, the model's already good enough in French. Yeah. But when you translate, you lose context. You lose the nuance of the language. Yeah. So that pushes your performance down, yeah. which means that translation helps you only to a certain extent. Yeah. If we look at how we prompt these different types of models, what we find is that for low resource languages, yeah, both translating and um, looking at how to structure examples to it um, makes a big difference. Again, this goes back to um, the, the impact that um, having a favorite language has. Yeah, and, but translation doesn't always solve everything. Yeah, so if we look at a comparison between Hindi and Urdu, so for the XMLI data set, which is the natural language inference data set, um, for English, we get about 76% accuracy. Yeah, but when we translate Urdu into English, yeah, our performance is barely better. Yeah, we don't get a huge increase. We're still stuck. We get to about 54% accuracy, which means that there are a huge amount of things that English isn't able to capture for Urdu. We're not sure whether that's just because of the quality of the translation, or we're using we're losing information by the by losing the nuances in the context of Urdu. And likelihood, it's a mixture of both. So, in summary, translation helps, but not necessarily always. Yeah, and it depends on what you're translating for. And you get the most gains in translation when your language is your your your, your target language is very very low resource. Um, and I'll jump over this is my thing. Um, so, what impacts the multilingual performance of, of these language models? Um, I've already talked about the nuances of translation and, and, and context and so forth, but there's a lot more going on there. The first thing that we looked at here is tokenization. Um, for those that are not aware, tokenization is the process of converting your text and the information that you type into the input that these models process. And models like uh, the GPTs use subword tokenization, which means that they take a given word and they break it up and then tokenize, i.e. encode each one of those components and put it forward. So for example, if I take um, an example of, let me see, uh, today's, yeah, today's consists of today and an S. So that will be broken up into today and S because today is the more common word in today's. And then we're going to encode those. Yeah, so tokenization is about how we break these uh, words up. And the more we break words up, 
yeah. the larger the input gets and the more noise that we add. So imagine a language where every word is broken up into a particular character, i.e. we're now doing basically byte encoding. Yeah, we're going to have a much larger input yeah, and we're effectively going to fragment the input, adding noise to it. Yeah, and we see that. So if you look at on the left-hand side, yeah, on this figure where we measure the tokenization, the tokenized fertility, which is on average how many com how many individual segments is each word broken up into. For languages like English, French, and in this case Japanese, actually it's a little bit more than the number of words. Yeah, so it doesn't break it up very much. And then you go right to the other end and you look at languages like Tamil. Yeah, and you see that each word is massively broken up. Yeah, in fact, it almost turns into byte encoding, yeah, which means that you're effectively putting individual characters in instead of individual words and hoping to make sense of them as you sort of go up these transformer layers, yeah, which is in effect yeah, adding, making the sequences much larger yeah, and destroying a lot of the coherence that links these, uh, these, these characters in order to form words. So one of the biggest impacts, impacts uh, one of the things that has the biggest impact on the performance of these models we find is the quality of the tokenization. Yeah, and we can directly measure that. Yeah. So in this figure, what we're looking at is um, a, the, the, on the, the x-axis, the tokenizer facility, i.e. how much is a word broken up versus the score across data sets. Yeah, for GPT-35, uh, if we look at it on the left-hand side, we have English, which is the highest performing language, uh, or rather the language has the lowest tokenization factor, that is the tokenization fertility, and Tamil, which has the highest tokenization fertility, and we effectively have a negative correlation. Yeah, more a, 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 a word broken up, the higher the tokenizer fertility, the lower the performance. Yeah, and we see that again, with GPT-4. Yeah. The other thing that impacts is the amount of pre-trading data. Yeah. How much data in that particular language has the model seen previously? Yeah. And here we compare uh, Oriya, which is the language spoken in a central Indian state, to English, where Oriya has the um, lowest amount of data and English has the highest amount of data. And what we see is, in effect, um, a positive correlation between the size of the pre-training data and the score, i.e. the more data that you train your model with, as expected, the higher the score. Yeah. And this trend is repeated again, and it's consistent. So we can affect, predict how well a language is likely to perform with a given model by simply looking at, or at least have a good idea, by looking at how are the inputs broken up, i.e. what's the tokenized ability, and how much data does the model see. This raises some uh, issues uh, for us, which are um, when we think about improving these models, um, we need to really think about data. Yeah, What is the data that's available for us to be able to give the model the prior that it needs in order to be able to work with these languages? Now, um, in conducting these experiments, um, we had a lot of challenges, uh, which I want to talk about briefly because I think it's important for you to just understand uh, that it's not as simple as just taking your data and putting it in there. Um, first of all, there's a kaleidoscope of choices. There's so many decisions to be made. How do you design a prompt? So how do you instruct a model? Uh, do you give it a um, um, direct instruction? Do you give it an example? Do you give it a chain of thought? Do you give it explanations? How do you present this information? Yeah. How do you give it examples? Um, what we're doing at the moment is in context learning. Uh, in context learning is a move away from our traditional supervised and semi supervised and, uh, and, 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 and you know, unsupervised training where you know we are giving um, where, where, where we are specifically um, directing the model with an error signal. Here we're giving it information and we're saying use that information to learn how to be able to answer a task. Yeah. We know that giving it more examples helps. Yeah. How? Yeah, how many examples? How do you structure them? What type of examples? Yeah. Um, another one is what language do you prompt in? We've seen that um, emitting through higher resource languages helps. Yeah. But 
all languages aren't created equal even in a pivot set. So if you're looking at, for example, a West African language, the chances are you have much more text than French yeah, than English. Yeah. So how do you select the language that you're pivoting through? Yeah. If you're looking at a language, which is the bottom of a, of a language tree, yeah, maybe you can use the languages that it's related to. How do you select those? How do you put them together? How do you take advantage of the choices and combinations that you have? Yeah. External tools. We saw that um, using um, um, the affordance of translation helps, but not always. What other tools are available? Yeah. How can we take advantage of the masses of information and knowledge that we have in linguistics in order to be able to improve the tools that we have in order to be able to give these models hints and support in order to be able to answer these questions? Um, the decoding hyperparameters. So when you generate these outputs, you've got to select some numbers. You've got to select the temperature. You've got to select the example. And so forth. How do we select those? Yeah. These are all things that you need to think about just simply in, in, in simply trying to test these, uh, these models. I won't go into these results, but I'll share the paper. Um, another one that really got us was data set contamination. Um, for all intents and purposes, I think it's safe to assume models such as GPT-4 have seen the internet in almost in its entirety yeah, up to the point that they were trained. And these models are built on data that's collected by crawlers that go out there and we know that these things try to grab as much data as possible in order to be able to train these models. Yeah, so there's a high likelihood that the data that you're testing your model on is something that's already seen. Yeah, and for this work, we considered a few things to try to understand how to quantify and, and measure and probe to what extent a model knows the data we're going to be examining it on. Um, we looked at trying to probe the model directly about the data sets. So asking the model um, about the structure of the data, the structure of the content, the type of the content. We looked at um, the, the, the availability of the data. So is it data sets that you need to, that you can just crawl and directly download, or do you need to go through some process which might um, inhibit bots to be able to pull this data back? Yeah, and the data set creation uh, date. So when was the data created? Um, to our surprise, what we found is that for a lot of the data sets that come from, that, that have been around for the last few years, there's a good chance that the model has seen it. Yeah. But, and, and we, we know that because we're able to probe them, we're able to ask it about the data, we're able to ask content of the data, we're able to ask the structure of the data, we're able to get things back. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's fully memorized that data so we can reproduce um, the results perfectly. Yeah. So you must always be um, considerate of what data that you are probing these models with and how you're probing these models. So in summary of this part of the talk, there's a significant disparity between the performance of LLM in English and non-English uh, languages, especially for low resource languages and non-Latin script languages. So the models don't work so well when you're not using English or a Latin, a non-Latin script language. Um, we saw that um, um, fine-tuned models are able to outperform these models on specific tasks, but now you're taking on an extra cost. You've got to curate data and you've got to find a model for that particular task. Uh, and it's often difficult to do better than translating uh, into a um, a pivot language, yeah, when you're when you're dealing with a low resource language, yeah, which is a shame because now you're using a pivot language, which means that you're losing context for that language, yeah. and tokenization is a big problem, yeah, because models, uh, and, and, and we see that a lot in non-Latin script languages, because these models are predominantly trained in, 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 in languages that are coming from the global north and are predominantly written with a Latin script, it means that when you're not dealing with that context, you have a problem that you have to try to figure out how to go about solving. Um, I want to, having given you that uh, sort of run through of the paper's results, I want to take a slightly different perspective and uh, look at what this means for equity, specifically um, because we're in Africa and we're interested in 
how these models serve Africans better, and more importantly, people that aren't necessarily in the global north where um, these models are already there and effectively serving them. And we're interested in sending why. Okay, so um, I've shown you earlier that the the, the axis of success were um, compute data size and parameters. And what I'm going to sort of hypothesize is that, that these are also three axes of doom for us. Yeah, because each one of these axes means cost. Yeah, uh, it means an increased cost in the production of these models. Yeah, and it's not just the dollar cost, yeah, it's the energy cost. So training GCP3, for example, has been estimated to be equal to um, going to the moon and back in the car, which I think is ridiculous. Yeah, um, larger data sets. Yeah. Uh, we saw that having a larger data set or having a more uh, a larger coverage in the language that you're interested in means that you get better performance. But that also means that these models aren't necessarily data efficient, which means that for languages that are lower resource, we have another problem, which we don't necessarily have, a, or those at least right now don't have a solution for. How do we deal with that data gap? Yeah. And low resourcedness here isn't just structural, sorry, it isn't just about the, the volume of data that you have, but it's a structural and uh, systemic thing. Yeah, it goes to the heart of access to technology. There's huge amounts of French data out there because there's a lot of people in 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 in, in French speaking countries in France that have access to computers, that have access to good Wi-Fi, good internet. And there's a lot of English out there because a large chunk of the um, global north speaks English. Yeah. So we don't. We we need to understand how to be able to address these structural challenges in order to be able to generate the kind of data sets that we can build these models with. Then there's access to expertise. Yeah. And then there's the cost of production. Yeah. How much does it cost to produce this stuff? Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. Past data can be complex and costly to generate, yeah? especially for the kind of things that we're interested in. If you're interested in data for things like climate, for healthcare, you're talking about fairly specialized data that's going to be expensive and time consuming to generate. Yeah. All of this raises the question of who pays for this. Yeah. Now, another perspective is that typically, uh, at least in when, when years ago, um, we, 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 we were thinking about the notion of machine learning as a service. And the idea was that you know, you've got data, infrastructure, and models, and then users use these models. And that model isn't true anymore. It's simply outdated. Users aren't interested in data mach in machine learning. Most people don't care about machine learning. What people are interested in are applications and intelligence. Yeah, they want to have things that do a job for them. Yeah. So what that means is that now we need to have these flywheels that are able to, in effect, um, collect data for problems. Yeah. And then build around these solutions, yeah. So that intelligence can be provided by task specialists, yeah, who can do rapid ingestion of data and update their models and react to the needs of core users, yeah. What this means is that we now need to think about task efficiency. Yeah, how quickly am I able to get a model to give me an answer? Which is dependent on how quickly am I able to get that model, the kind of data that it needs in order to, be able to generate that answer, and how much can I afford in order to be able to specialize this. So taking advantage of these models, again, goes back to access and cost. Yeah. And this model is something that we're already seeing, you know, um, especially now that GPT and OpenAI are out there as a service. We're seeing a huge range of model and applications that are being built on top of them. Yeah. But who are these applications serving? Yeah. And this is the question that we must be considered of yeah, so that we can understand how useful are they for our context. And if they're not useful for our context, we have to understand how can we modify them for them to be useful for our context. And all of this impacts. Yeah, it means that we have barriers that might be limiting access to intelligence. We have people that might be able to take advantage of these technologies, but don't necessarily have access to either the hardware, to the models, to the compute, to the data in order to be able to serve these models as a, a, a for people. Yeah. So there are possibly two routes, and, and, and this is contentious, yeah, to to increase access in order to produce this gap. Yeah. One is differentiated access, 
to commercial models, i.e., you have a one-stop, uh, you know, one-stop uh, solution where you go to with your data and you get a model back. This is effectively what OpenAI is offering. You have data, you buy access to their API, you provide the data to that API, it gives you answers. Yeah, but that's costly. The other is community effort to generate data, to build models, to build tools, and then put them out there. Yeah, this is DIY. Yeah, but starting from a reasonable um, position. Yeah. And for differentiated access already, you're seeing it. Uh, lots and lots of services are now building on solutions from open AI and so forth. Um, but they're costly. Yeah. Um, this was a, a grab for Dali and a little while ago. And what you see is that um, you go up to $60 per month, um, depending on the number of tokens. That you so um, depending on the number of tokens that you're using, um, no, this is a mid journey. Um, for language models, um, sorry. language models, um, the cost can range from uh, um, you know, zero zero four um, cents to about uh, um, two cents uh, per thousand tokens, and this is for the more powerful models. So when you're starting talking about Two, two cents for a thousand tokens, then you start having to consider, okay, what's the kind of application that I can do? Uh, a thousand tokens isn't huge. If you're asking something to summarize the passage, if you're asking something to generate data, if you're asking something to compare stuff, uh, mm -hmm. that two cents will go in a few calls. Yeah. So now when you're thinking about people that are building applications for these things, you have to think about, okay, how do they pay for these applications? From the other side, when we look at the community efforts, we've seen a massive growth in community projects. Uh, everything from Masakane to Indaba to Sisonke, uh, Biontech, all of these different types of uh, specialized um, applications and groups and users and so forth, all coming together in order to address this issue. Yeah. But they have a limiting factor, which is yeah, that they require people to be able to do the job. Yeah, they require organization, they require funding. Yeah. And while community efforts have by and large been very successful recently, yeah, the advent of these very large models means that we might face some barriers. Yeah. Um, because we're not necessarily going to get access to the weights of these models. Yeah, and even if you did get access to the grades of these models, the cost of running them is prohibitively expensive. Um, so this goes back to the age-old question for me, which is, if we want to make these models useful for as many people as possible, we have to address the question of who pays for it. And who pays for it isn't just the, 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 the cost of running the model, but the cost of building the model, the cost of collecting the data, the cost of organizing the data, cleaning it, um, and then we have to think about who pays for the application to specialize the model, to test it, to get it out to people. Yeah. Um, while community efforts are effective, they're inherently, they're, they are inherently limited. They are very complex to organize. Yeah. And that cost of accomplishing the intended task is effectively distributed along the community, which means that you're now reliant on volunteers to give their time. Now, Commercial efforts are have, have been shown to be useful, but now if you want to take advantage of these commercial providers, you have to think about the application. You have to pay for it. Yeah. So if your application isn't necessarily going to be generating the kind of revenue that's required in order to pay for that service, then the commercial services aren't necessarily going to be effective in bridging that gap. Yeah. Um, and if we think about serving the 80% of the world that is the global north tech workers, yeah, LLMs and their resulting applications will be useful if we can find ways to incentivize innovators to build local solutions that use these platforms to service need. Yeah, but that requires cost. Yeah, the more we specialize these things, the higher the cost. Yeah, yeah. If we can identify use cases, that have appeal uh, that can then impact and, and touch across cultures and language barriers. Yeah, what that will do is it will, it will amortize the cost of building these models and serving these models 
But we then have to think about, okay, what are those use cases? How do we get those use cases to the right people? How do we get the people that could do these things trained and give them access in order to be able to do that? So there are inherent limitations that come from the, the, the systemic nature of no resources, which impact how well these kind of models can serve the wider um, the, the, the wider needs of people. And these are things, things that I think we need to think about. As a community, we need to think this technology is out. There's no putting it back in the, in the box. Yeah. And it's useful. How do we make it useful for more people? How do we make it useful for the kind of things that we care about? Yeah. And how do we structure these things such that this isn't something that just happens by chance, but it's intended? Mm. And all of that goes back to, for me, incentives. Yeah. And incentives means what are the applications that best benefit from these models and these, uh, these, these uh, infrastructures? Yeah, because now they're more than models. They're, they're, they're whole ecosystems, infrastructures, and services, and so forth. Yeah. How do we lower the cost? Uh, how do we lower the access barriers, both technology, expertise, infrastructure? Yeah, and expertise and infrastructure are two things that are close to my heart. Because um, you may be able to afford it, but if you don't have the expertise, if you don't have the people that know how to specialize these things, if you don't have people that know how to modify these things to be able to serve the kind of applications that they're interested in, that kind of applications that their communities can benefit from, then that benefit is lost. And so how do we do that? How do we up our skills so that we can take advantage of these things? Yeah, yeah. And finally, all of this relates back to innovation. Yeah, if we can't do these things, we have a lost opportunity. Yeah, there is, because there are many, many people out there that benefit from these things. There are many, many people out there that have much better ideas than we do, yeah, but they're not getting active. They're not getting the training. They're not getting the, the required resources to be able to build, innovate, and put these things out to the world. Yes. And on that, I'm going to stop uh, uh, and thank you and open up for questions. Um, I hope that um, this has sparked some thoughts in you and I'm interested in hearing your ideas. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks for that, uh, Mohammed. Uh, that was great. Um, and I really, I think, covered a lot. And, and also thanks for your personal kind of reflections within, within here. I think to kick it off, uh, for everybody else, um, Please, if you want to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand and then I will acknowledge you and then you can unmute and then ask your question. Uh, but to kick us off, uh, maybe I wanted to ask it. In, in, in this part, I think a, a big part, um, a question that's coming up, especially within the community driven spaces at the moment is what happens when like, you know, we, we have these communities, they're creating data, they, they are making sure that the data is available in open licenses, but, People like yourself, and I'm not really saying you, but who work in big tech are likely the people who can exploit these community, what the output of these community efforts are first than the communities themselves. So maybe some thoughts around that. I, I, that I really think, yeah. I, I really think that, yeah, that that's a great question um, because it goes back to the, the, the resource issue. Um, I'm in the position of working for a large tech company, um, which has the resources, which has the technology and which has the expertise um, and would love these types of data sets because it improves product. It improves the kind of models that we can build. Now, if, if, if we want these things to be useful and if we want to be um, conscious of the efforts of, of, of data generators, I think two things need to happen. One, an acknowledgement that we need these efforts, that this data has to be generated somehow, and it's not necessarily going to come out of the, 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 the pockets of large tech, because large tech is not necessarily driven by the, 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 the social impulse. It's often driven by the profit. Yeah. And two, the recognition that because this data is generated, um, for communities, by communities, yeah. they have to have benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. They need to, um, we, we need to build a culture where the benefit isn't necessarily just how much profit can be, does you know, company X make, but what's the responsibility company X has 
to the generators of that data, to the communities where that data comes from. Yeah. And how can they give back the kind of things that they're building to these communities such that that, that there is shared benefit? Yeah. And I think there's another thing which is related to here, which is that that sort of virtuous cycle of if people see benefit from what they're generating, they're likely to put more into it. If people are able to take advantage of the outputs of these technologies, yeah, they're much more likely to trust these technologies and generate more material for these technologies to be able to improve. So we need to start thinking about better partnerships, better models for social responsibility that return the benefits of the diamond data sets that are generated back in the communities that they come from. Well, that's my personal perspective on this. Okay. No, thank you on that. Uh, Siani, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi, how are you? Hi, Siani. I'm good, thank you. Hi. I'm just interested on the zero shot learning. Um, why did you think of adding it? Did you check the results before adding it? And what was the difference before and after using it? So, to step back a bit, um, in context learning is the idea that you provide an instruction and then a query, and then the model uses that instruction in order to answer the query. So there is no gradient updates. There is no error that's coming back. You are doing all the evaluation and judgment within that context of input. And for complex things, it therefore makes sense to give an idea to the model of what the thing that it's trying to do is. Give it examples of the what kind of answer to generate and what that looks like. And what's been found is that providing examples to models um, helps them perform better in this setting. Yeah. And so what we were interested in was how many examples do you need to provide? Yeah. Uh, and how do you structure these examples? And what we found was that, and you can refer to the paper for details, um, for high resource languages for some tasks, you don't need to provide a huge number of examples. Yeah. Three, four, five examples gives you the same performance as 10, 15, 20 examples. But for low resource languages, you often get a benefit from providing more examples. Yeah, so giving the model more hints on how to answer. Right? So we were exploring that space of how much information to provide and how do you structure that information. And we looked at both um, changing the input language for that information. So instead of using a pivot language to provide the examples, also you providing it in the target language, uh, structuring the examples in different ways and increasing and decreasing the number of examples. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Sian? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Gotcha. There was a question from... Um... Abang, uh, if he can unmute, but he asked it in terms of, I think you had talked a bit about the the cost of training, um, but 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 maybe like it will, for, 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 for a person who is not at the level that maybe of, of, of being able to bring up as many GPUs as big tech and all those things, what, what is the intuition here outside being able to use Colab for free and then maybe signing up for co, co, um, co, what is a Colab Pro or something like that? But, what, what is actually the scaling requirement, uh, like the intuition that some people should have of if, 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 let's say tomorrow, the African Union somehow said, we are giving $1 billion to a African uh, large language model project, how much of it is gonna end up being just spent on compute? That, that's just shit. That's um, okay, so for numbers, um, estimated costs for pre-training gigantic models is sort of estimated the, in the top end of the tens of billions, in the tens of millions to the hundreds of millions. Uh, while fine-tuning these models is as low as you know hundreds of dollars to millions of dollars depending on what you're doing and so here we're talking of orders of magnitude difference you know, between what it costs to pre-train 
a very, very large model and what it costs to specialize an existing model. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, the, the advent of the Llama model, which I think is fantastic, um, where we're seeing if we start off with very well trained, smallish language models, and Llama is by is in my imagination not small, but compared to the, the, the GPTs, it's tiny. We can do a lot with fine tuning them. Yeah. So, what I would think is not necessarily in terms of the cost of training uh, as, as, there, as, a, as a modulating factor, but the cost of generating data that can take advantage of that training. Yeah. So, I would sort of change the question around a bit and answer. What would be the best thing to spend that money on? And for me, the best thing to spend that money on would be data. Yeah, in order to generate the kind of data sets that not just now, but multiple generations and multiple communities can use and reuse in order to bridge the information gap of what can be presented to the models. That's where I think our biggest gap is. Okay. No, uh, I think uh, with that, uh, thanks again, uh, Mohammed, also for taking time out of your your your, your break and, uh, and and vacation with your family. Um, it's 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 been great. Uh, um, I think this talk has uh, given us a lot to think about. I think this thanks for the questions that have also come along, and there have been lots of people now asking and saying, "Is is the video going to be available?" Yes, it is. Uh, it will be on you on our YouTube channel um, uh, later today. I I pasted our social media stuff so you can join us and also subscribe to our YouTube channel on this on this one. And I think this was a really great way to kick off this, this year's seminar series. And we look forward to uh, really having uh, as many of you back um, as, 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 as possible and then seeing um, how this kind of area actually um, evolves. Uh, if you will be coming to the Indaba in Accra, uh, there will be a lot of us there as well. Uh, so we do look forward to also meeting in Ghana. There seems to be, it's, it's going to be, it's massive at the moment. Uh, that's a lot of um, work over the next month, I think is just going to be in getting people there. Um, uh, but yeah, thanks, Mohammed. Thanks everybody for coming in and please do enjoy the rest of your Friday. And for those in South Africa, yeah, uh, keep warm as it's getting very cold over there. Thank you, Mohammed, And thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess uh, the last thing I want to leave people with is if, if you're in this position, if you're thinking about these things, don't think about how do I retrain these models. Think about what can I use them to build? What, what can I build with them? That's where you have most effect and most impact. Um, understanding what problems that they can solve for you and how you can get the solutions to as many people as possible because that multiplies your impact and then that generates the resources and the data to be able to go further. Thank you okay, for the last me. thing on my side, can I contact you after the meeting and we talk more about it? Of course, um, um, I think my contact emails are shared. Please feel free to contact yeah. me. Oh. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you.